Um, it's great to see you this morning. Uh, if you want to, we can shut the, the signal door as well, I think, at the back from what, when I've done emailed round and just stop the draft from coming through, um, taking those mitigating factors. And the door will be open as we come in and also wedge back as we go out. I think certainly at the moment, maybe not in the middle of winter, we'll have to decide how things are progressing, just to save then everybody touching the handles. But at the point where everybody's in, uh, it's probably uh, this, this will then um, help. Uh, as we go through. But we're all trying to work this out as we journey through this thing that we're in. Um, we're going to start off with Psalm 95. This is normally done for those who do BCP uh, in, as part of BCP morning prayer. Um, and so we're doing the NIV version, so there are a few words that are di different. Um, as we go through the psalm, and on this psalm, the other psalm, I've left in um, some of the alternative translations there in, in red. In this psalm, um, it's because actually uh, they do uh, translate it to the alternatives uh, in the uh, Book of Common Prayer, and it's to the to what the word trans the Hebrew word translates to, because they named the places after what happened there, and so you can just get that sense of the history of Israel and the way they interacted with God uh, coming through. The other thing to note in this psalm is just how uh, it relates to the sea. I will pick that up later, and so we'll leave it just for you as a sort of like teaser trailer at the start of the service um, to hopefully start to help you to gear in. So let's say together. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountains peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, or as you did at the day of Masnasa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For forty years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. They shall never enter my rest. Amen. Um, I put the, the things in there not as a sort of a, a, a thing for APCM that we shouldn't be quarrelling or uh, testing, um, but more because of the issue to do with the sea but more about later, but overall, God is over everything. So this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And as we come to God, and uh, we recognise that God is good, uh, we remember that perhaps it's us that have made mistakes, and we make our confession to God. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin, and turn to Christ, confessing our sin in penitence and faith. We say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Amen. Let's say, the Lord says to his people, I have given you as a light to the nations, and I have called you in righteousness. Thus says God, who created the heavens, who fashioned the earth and all that dwells in it, who gives breath to the people upon it, and spirit to those who walk in it. I have given you as a light to the nations, 
and I have called you in righteousness. I am the Lord, and I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind. I have given you as a light to the nations, and I have called you in righteousness, to bring out the captives from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other. I have given you as a light to the nations, and I have called you in righteousness. Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. I have given you as a light to the nations, and I have called you in righteousness. Almighty Father, whose Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, may we, your people, shine with the radiance of your glory, now and forever. Amen. Um, I've dropped the APCM off the list of things uh, in this slot, mainly because it's today, and so... But, I must say, uh, I managed to... Uh, Pulling another nomination this morning from St. John's, and that's why I was a little bit delayed uh, coming back because we had to get somebody to second and some uh, to propose and second them. Um, but uh, that just uh, threw my timings getting here. But if anybody else still wants to be on PCC, we can still at the end of the service before we start the APCM uh, generate those things, uh, nominations for you or actually join the APCM. I published the balance of marriage between Sean Francis Glenn and Stacey Marie Robinson, both of the parish of St. Thomas Hazel Grove, but with Sean having a historic, uh, a, a qualifying connection to this parish. Um, if anybody knows of any reasons in law why these persons may not marry, they are to declare it now. This is for the third time of asking. And I have already written in wherever. The names for the ones that start in the start of November. Yay. <laughs> um, the service of remembrance, uh, the service of remembering, uh, is due to be well, certainly at least one version is due to be on the, on the first Sunday in November, uh, as we do sort of somewhere around about All Souls. Um, if you wish for an invite to that, please see or contact Jenny, as we're going to try and sort of do this by invitation so that we know the numbers that are coming uh, to each service. If there's more than is needed for one service, then we'll try and put on other services uh, so that we can still do it. But it's not quite just the open invitation that we normally do, and um, people could turn up on, on the night as we try and manage the flow of numbers uh, as we go through uh, this year. We come to the first of our readings from Scripture. The first reading is from Paul, chapter 27, verses 1 to 44. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Adrametum about to sail for, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends, so that they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again, and passed to the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea, after Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Mia in Mysia, where the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty in arriving off Nidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete, opposite Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Haven, near the town of Lessie. 
Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous, because by now it was after the day of atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our bad voyage is going to be dangerous, and bring great loss to ship and cargo, and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of Pilate and the owner of the ship. Since the harbour was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we would sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbour in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force, called the Northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Corda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men had hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid that it would run aground on the sandbars of Sartes. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, to, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage then, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven along the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 40 metres deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 30 metres deep. <coughs> Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they got four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. 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 Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes and held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After this, he, after he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. He broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. 
putting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and it would not move and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept him from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest were to get on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. This is the word of the Lord. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used in paying the tax. 
they brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Saviour, born in the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors, and to remember his holy covenant. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, send your Holy Spirit and your ministering angels to us now, that they may speak to us, even as they spoke to Paul. Amen. Um, you'll probably know uh, of me by now, as we've been here about two years, that uh, one of the things I believe about Scripture is that it is complete uh, and it shows to us stuff that speaks to our life. In that sense, most of Scripture is narrative, and there are enough narrative stories in Scripture of how God has worked in Scripture to connect with our narrative and to help to show us and guide us into the future as narrative impacts narrative and speaks to us now. And that's part of what I want to do this morning on this slightly longer narrative uh, of a whole chapter is just draw that out. But in particular, I want to do it by trying to connect it um, to two modern narratives. Uh, so Paul being in danger at sea uh, to uh, perhaps the state of the Church of England and stuff over the last um, few decades. Uh, and to us personally as a country journeying through pandemic and try and start to hook some of the hooking points that make connection and then hopefully the screen will be at work in you and say to you things uh, that you need to hear and corporately say it to us as we wrestle with how the, the different ones interact of these narratives overlap and that gives us illumination and guidance that we need. Paul is uh, afraid of the sea. Um, partly this is cultural. Um, we did earlier Psalm 95, and that talks of God being the God of the sea. And that is one of the perspectives of the Old Testament. But the Old Testament wrestles with order and disorder, order and chaos. And the other side in the Old Testament for a non-seafaring nation is that the sea with all its wild moods is a source of chaos and danger. And perhaps this is easiest for us to see if you look at the flat from where you move from sort of like the start of the Bible and creation to the end of the Bible and Revelation. God's revealing of his new thing in the end. And this, um, John uh, has this sort of dream vision of what God is saying and he does it in pictures and cultural references of his day. Um, he says that in chapter 21, I looked and there was a new heaven and a new earth come from God for the first heaven and first earth had passed away. Um, and the sea was no more. Now, is that really that we think that God just hates the sea and hates all the creatures of the sea? and isn't really bothered about the coral reefs bleaching, um, as we've heard again that they've done. I don't think so. I think this is in a dream and it's activating the culture of their day and the sea was a source of danger and chaos, almost a chaos monster that would envelop them at a moment's notice. And they had a great fear of the sea and one of the things that would really come to Paul's mind would be the story of Jonah and the whale and the moods of the sea and being swallowed by a whale and then 
the rest of the ship being saved and being in the belly of the whale for three days crying to God and then saved. Um, and that would have been the sort of image that would come to mind that the sea was a dangerous place. That for Paul is also uh, echoed by the fact that he's had personal experiences. In 2 Corinthians, it gives this long list of Paul at danger of land and at danger of sea, and he identifies that he's already been shipwrecked three times, one time being in the sea uh, for a night and a day. Now, if 2 Corinthians is written in Ephesus um, before this, a few years back, then he's already been shipwrecked three times. If this is one of the three times, and 2 Corinthians is not written until he's in Rome, then where are the other two occasions? And as we've said a number of times as we've gone through Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Apostles is best understood as some of the Acts of some of the Apostles. It isn't the entirety, and he's at least uh, been in danger in the sea before. So both from his culture and from his experience, he is afraid in his history of the sea. And that's perhaps the first phase and uh, affects how he faces it when they're having difficulty traveling along the south coast of modern day Turkey and beating out around Crete. And he just goes, oh. and we've got past Yom Kippur, it's at the end of September, and it's getting into autumn and autumn storms. And he just goes, we can't go any further. Um, and um, Perhaps that echoes some of how we are uh, as a culture, uh, echoing it for the pandemic in terms of in our postmodern world where we think science should have already found the answers to everything, then surely somebody must be wrong if people are dying and suffering, and, and it's wrong that people are suffering and dying, and it's wrong that the, the, the therapy that we're using of lockdown is creating other people to suffer and lose livelihoods and that, and just something's wrong in all this. And our culture just can't cope with that uncertainty. And then added to that, perhaps you had personal experience of very severe illness for yourself or in the family. Maybe you're still staying away from church uh, to, to some safeguard yourself or family. Uh, and how do we negotiate these risks? Or as a church, as you look at the church being in decline, maybe since the turn of the 19th century, around about the Boer War, certainly since after the Second World War, um, and do you look at the church that's been then under pressure, and I knew as a sort of young teenager that most of my friends didn't go to church and thought it was old hat in the 80s, 40 years ago now, and there's a cultural thing going on, and then perhaps personal experience. Where when I was in the West Bolton team, we shut one of the churches, and um, I also went back to Audley to preach at the last and to lead the last service of my home Methodist church, the church where in the church in their hall I'd come to faith. Um, now, there is some good news out of that. It's not all doom and gloom because that church, as they combined, they combined because uh, the, it's in a mining area and uh, they needed to underpin the whole building because uh, it was risk of imminent collapse. So they decided not to do that. They went down and joined the local Methodist church. And certainly over the first few years, they experienced church growth. And I've also been involved in church plants. And for instance, uh, the church that I was a curate at we decided to build a new church hall because the old one was a uh, sort of Second World War prefab. And that again led, even though it was a large outlay of money, as it was at that current time experiencing that people wouldn't come to church because it wasn't the sort of experience that people wanted or wouldn't go to the church hall. The use of the church hall will move into a refurbished building, but in, re, uh, in, in building a new one, they again got a new lease of life from that risk and that outlay. So um, it's not all quite fully aligning up to Paul's experience here, but you can certainly see there's parallels when you look at the past, that culture and fear, uh, our own expectations uh, all lay into where Paul's at. And Paul goes, we can't go any farther than Centurion, looks at other opinions, and the owner and the pilot are both saying, yeah, we can go further. It's not too late in the season yet. This isn't a harbour where we can harbour overnight. We can't stay here. We have to move on. And so they listen to others 
and move on. But then the northeaster comes down and carries them uh, deeper into the Mediterranean, and everything goes wrong. They're just dragged like they are now dragging a sea anchor. I think, if I've understood, and it's a pity that Ken Fogg isn't here because I know he's been caught in the Bay of Isby, but I think a sea anchor is where you take something like your sail and you drag it behind so that the drag of this, that in the sea, which is moving slower than the wind, helps to keep you orientated so that you ride with the, the ship rather than get hit on the side of your ship where you'll roll more. Um, by the waves hitting the side and so they're starting to do that they're starting to throw the very tackle of the ship overside to try and lighten the ship so it rides higher in the water and can ride over the waves as they're bashing against it and everybody now starts to be afraid and everybody now starts to lose hope and perhaps the middle one is perhaps where it seems that we are at as we move into a second wave on the pandemic. Um, it then activates all our fears, perhaps uh, for the church as a whole. You worry, as I do, that this may be a knock to the church, to the side of the church that just uh, means that over the country lots of churches will close following this, as people get out of the habit of coming to church and that choice being available to them. And we feel we're in that situation. Now is when God speaks to Paul. I think the earlier part is possibly out of Paul's fear, and he just out of fear says, don't go any further. But now quite clearly God speaks to Paul, and often Paul gets his dreams and visions at times where he comes to a dead end, when he was journeying northwest across Turkey and ended up at Charas, uh, and he was sort of faced with, what on earth, where on earth do I go now with my missions? God spoke to him and called him across to mainland Europe. As he was working his way with all sorts of detours through Europe, possibly heading to Rome, gets as far as Corinth and hears the message, the doors of Rome are shut to the Jewish community, you can't go further. And God gives him a vision. As he journeys towards Jerusalem and those around him are getting the message from God, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be arrested. God speaks to him again. And now as he's at sea, being at sea for days, probably my guess would be on short rations rather than quite eating nothing, uh, just the length of time they're at sea and that they do have um, grain still in the hold and that the sailors certainly wouldn't be able to manage a ship for 14 days without food it being wet and cold and the sheer weight of managing that at the sea um, but in his hyperbole talking of eating nothing oh I was so hungry they didn't my son will say that all the time they didn't feed me and perhaps slightly in hyperbole here and God speaks into that and God says, Paul, I've still got a purpose for you. And you will go to Rome. And he doesn't just finish there. But he says, not only you, but all your travel companions will be safe. And that's not just the Christian ones who are journeying with you to support you. Because we know in the early, certainly in the early stage of the journey there was a friend from Thessalonica there with him. Maybe still there on this second change of ship. But every single soul, this 276, I think he was, uh, that are on this ship with you. And perhaps to that the doctor says to us, God says to us, and this is certainly my hope as I've been reflecting on this passage, that perhaps God is saying, God still is mindful to save not only his church, but the whole of the parish. The parish system of which we're based gives us shared with the bishop and with me and with you the cure of souls of the parish. That we're not here just to rescue ourselves, but to be here for every soul that lives in the, ultimately as the Church of England, in the whole of Great Britain. And that through the storm, God will still rescue and that's hope for the church. 
And through this pandemic, we will still get to the other side of it. Whether it is the much sought after uh, immunization, or whether it's just that treatments are improving, whether it is an increased reliance on vitamin D is finally the government to say, no, go on, take vitamin D, it's so cheap and seems to be effective. Even if we're not fully certain of all the links, you might as well take it. But whatever it is, we'll get through. There's a resilience uh, for us to get there. And then, I'm thinking in sort of perhaps the modern application, this is for me, sense to the future, Paul then journeys on, and he still stays on the boat for some more period of time. After he's had the vision, still in the storm. And perhaps there's some period of time ahead of us where things are rocky, both as a country in the pandemic and the Church of England struggling to find purchase again and a voice into a postmodern world that leads us to a, a great awakening like we had in the times of sort of the revivals after the Enlightenment. And as they journey on, there's a sense that something is coming to a completion, that they're getting to land. I don't know when that will be in the future, a sense that it's almost there. And at that point, Paul gives out the realm of cry, now's the time to find the energy, because everybody's energy was sapped. They'd be eating at least short rations, maybe nothing. They had been um, travelling at sea uh, in the battering waves. They thought they were going to die, and their moods would have dropped, and they would have been totally... Um, sort of wondering, is today the day we die, rather than is today the day we're saved? And they get a sense they're getting near land, and, and Paul tries to rally their spirits for one final push, and says, we've been trying to type, sort of spread out these rations, but now's the time to eat, to fill yourself up, to get energy, to push on for one more time, to carry on for what we're doing. And the way he does it is he takes some bread and he breaks it and thanks God for it. In the middle of the storm, in all the hunger that they feel, in all of their hopelessness, he starts with what would be the bar of prayer. Blessed be God uh, that he would know from his childhood. And the Baruch prayer that Jesus reinterpreted into the last communion. Possibly, therefore, effectively sharing communion. Because I can't imagine that when Paul breaks the bread and thanks God for it, he doesn't also thank God for Jesus Christ and his death as we do at communion still today. And he invites them to share in the spiritual resources that we have and to find energy and replenishment in the midst of the storm. And perhaps that's part of what we've got to look at, is we still need to find those places where we find energy and resources to get through the storm, to get through grief, to get through sickness, to get through the way that we all feel despondent and wonder, which tier am I in? What does that mean? Can I still weep with my family? And that in the midst of that, find some strength from God. And for some, that will be in communion. For others, it will be in our pattern of daily prayer. For others, it will be in reading scripture. For others, it will be in singing worship, which we can't do at church, but you can turn your Alexa up at home and sing along with it. For others, it will be getting out into creation and walking with God's good creation. And for others, it will be meeting with others, which might be over Zoom and in all sorts of virtual ways to find support in community. But God connects to us spiritually in lots of different ways. And for each of us, we'll have our home base that's better for us. And we need to rest in our home base and find the resources from that to carry on. Because we will be trying to do things and do some heavy lifting, do something around Remembrance Day, do something around Christmas or do something around Christmas. Mainly putting it on virtually online. And you can join in that because you can like what we put onto our Facebook page and you can reshare it. And if you reshare it with a comment, your friends are more likely to look and maybe get the message that God is there for them in the midst of the storm as well. And the good news at the end of this is that even despite nearly being killed by the soldiers, because that was a typical Roman thing to do, and being thrown out to sea and having to grab onto planks of wood or other things that would float, they all got to shore. 
And I don't know how long, I think we're more in that second phase where we're at sea and God might be speaking to us and just saying, he still thinks of us, he still knows us. He's still got a purpose for us. He's still got a purpose for this church in this parish because God is still concerned with the souls that live in these regions of Disley, Furnace, uh, Furnace Vale and Newtown and uh, further around that in the other villages around where we connect. And that God is still the God who in the midst of when we feel we're in the moors of a chaos monster that's going to devour us is still there to rescue us from the valley of the whale, from the beating of the sea, and from whatever it is that faces each of us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Not that Paul was driven in the sea for days, but that you still had concern for him at that time and for every soul in that boat. And Lord, we thank you that you still have concern for us and every soul in our parish. Lord, through this storm, lead us to safe shores and also, Lord, save others in our parish that your mission through this church to this parish may continue. Amen. In Christ alone.
So somewhere around about 2,000 years ago, Paul was on a boat in somewhere around about October time and beaten by the raging storm and we are when whatever rages we feel we are in today but we both have something to share that Jesus gave us and that's the Lord's Prayer as our Saviour taught us so we pray Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O oh God, for as much as without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We say together, Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you that you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger. Order us in all our doings, and guide us to do always what is right in your eyes, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue our prayers. As Tom Chase might say, will you pray with me? Lord, we pray for our church here in Disley and in Furness Vale. We ask for the resources to keep both of them alive, materially and spiritually. We know this requires us to commit to giving perhaps, to pay for the maintenance of the building and to provide staffing for the outreach of the church. We pray that there may be a revival of spiritual interest in the local area. Spur people to seek you in this place, that we may grow and thrive under your care and under your blessing. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for those in our church, in our fellowship, who are suffering grief and loss at this time. We pray for Ruth Gately, whose mother Marianne died recently, quite suddenly. We commit Marianne to your care. And we remember Ruth and ask that you would comfort and uphold her at this very difficult time and sad time. Also, we remember the family of John Kelly of our parish who died recently. And we ask that Stuart be given the words to bring them hope and comfort, and that we as a body of your people in this place might rally round and support them, both in prayer and practically if needed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our We remember and pray for Stuart as he takes services this week and ministers to people both in church and out. We pray for the Alpha Course. And for Stuart's visit to local primary schools, help us to be a support to him, not to hinder. Seeking where we can help, not just to let it all happen for us. We pray for our families and friends, all coping in different ways with this strange and unsettling time. Keep us safe, we ask, free from disease. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we bring before you those working on the front line in the war against COVID-19, NHS, scientists researching for a cure, teachers, shop workers, and many others. We pray for those furloughed or made redundant. Open doors for them. Help them not to go with, under with stress or worry or loss of the means to live. Grant our government wisdom and compassion 
and dealing with those affected in this way. We know we have gone astray and turned each one of us to our own way, but we pray that you won't turn your back on us as a nation. In your anger, Lord, remember mercy. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those organizations trying to bring your message of salvation and who show that you care by, the help, by helping the poor, the needy, the distressed, and the infirm. We pray for our local care homes and both the staff and the residents there. Keep their spirits up as they face loneliness, perhaps, or fear. Give them a hope for the future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our Finally, Lord, we remember those in authority and ask that you would sustain them and keep them well. From the royal family through to government, to the archbishops and bishops of the church, to local councils, councillors, the emergency services and armed forces. All those who help keep the fabric of this nation together. Lord, we ask these things for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we come to the end of the service, we're going to again uh, say something together, and this time Psalm 99. Uh, there's another little bit that's in red in this towards the end of the psalm, and that's uh, an alternative translation of that line. Um, and I think it's all to do with how you play a conjunction and whether the sins are the sins of Israel or the sins that are done to Israel. Um, but um, you'll see that when you come to it. So watch out for that one. And uh, that might be something to reflect on uh, the ambiguous nature of that translation. Um, but we're going to say Psalm 99 together. The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The King is mighty. He loves justice. You have established equity. In Jacob you have done what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron are among them his priests. Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called on the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them from the pillar of cloud. They kept his statutes and decrees he gave them. Lord our God, answer them. You were to Israel a forgiving God, though you punished their misdeeds. Exalt the Lord our God, and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. And God is holy, and there are still signs of hope, and uh, one of those things, signs of hope, comes uh, through the notices and leaflets that we put round the parish. And I have had a, uh, an email this week to ask by somebody else, said, I've seen your advert for the Alpha course, can I join in even at this late stage? And so that's a, a beautiful thing that has hoping, happened as hopefully a little seed of hope in the midst of it all. So the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. But we will be hopefully starting a brief uh, APCM immediately, so don't feel that you have to go, but you can actually stay, uh, but obviously you can go if you need to. And here's where I hope that I did do everything quite correct as we set up the video recording the service for those of us who can't yet be with us.